thing going to work? No. No. I'll just have to talk loudly. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to this lecture. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? I'll speak up. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Roger Smith to you. He is a field geologist and vertebrate paleontologist specializing in rocks and fossils of the Karoo. He's based at the Azico Museum in Cape Town and travels widely. He has participated in several collaborative research ventures in Eritrea, Niger, Lesotho, Namibia, Madagascar, and Antarctica, mostly funded by the American National Science Foundation and the National Geographical Society. This has allowed him to extend his search area for Karoo fossil faunas out of the Karoo Basin and into peripheral rift valleys. So welcome, Roger Smith, and enjoy your course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Welcome, and uh, it's a great turnout. It's good to see so many uh, new faces, although I do recognize uh, quite a number of you. And it's good to see you coming back obviously to revision before your exams, you know, that uh, the uh, end Permian mass extinction, as many of you know, in fact, probably all of you know, was the worst uh, natural disaster that the planet has yet experienced in, uh, in, that the, in, the, in the time frame in which we can uh, record in the rocks uh, of the planet that happening. Things that happened before we get solid crust, I cannot comment on, but since we had solid crust on the Earth's globe, this is the worst natural disaster and the worst uh, um, extinction that life has ever known. It happened 252 million years ago, and we are so fortunate in South Africa to have what now has becoming, um, let's say, well accepted as being the best terrestrial record of what happened at that time. I'm going to uh, give you the geological information first and the biological information tomorrow. Uh, hopefully you can then sort of see how we're building up this picture of not only how the extinction occurred, but what caused it. That's the, there are the two big questions. And of course they have bearing on you know, how we treat the planet today and how we can predict what might happen in future. You all know there's been five major mass extinctions, not major mass extinctions, five mass extinctions. Uh, they all uh, were devastating to life on Earth, and uh, the, the one in which um, you, you know a lot about, many people know a lot about the end Cretaceous mass extinction that uh, is apparently, or quite, uh, quite well substantiated now, was uh, affected by a massive meteorite impact at that time. And many, uh, in fact most of the dinosaurs, went extinct within that short period of time at 65 million years ago. We want to step back in time before the dinosaurs. There were no dinosaurs on the Earth at the time we are talking about, yet what happened at this time may well have been very uh, uh, significant in the origin of dinosaurs. The, the end Permian, 200 and now 252 million years. And just as a pictograph here, you can sort of see the, uh, the way in which the continents have moved around the globe uh, is of course well known, and that's the phenomena of continental drift. Yet uh, something special was happening at this time, then all the continents were together in a single landmass known as Pangaea. So we must already feel that the Earth was suffering uh, uh, rather unusual circumstances at that time with all the land on one side of the globe and just open ocean on the other. 
So mass extinctions are not just some any old extinction. We have de defined them. We need to define them. And at the moment, we are happy when more than 40% of species uh, across the globe, on the, in the oceans and on, on land and in the air, go uh, extinct within a relatively short period of time, geologically speaking, uh, between half a million years and as little as 10,000 years. So that's a... a dramatic, uh, at a, that's um, a rapid extinction event, and they are caused, can we, can we put it off, please? Can we put off the lights? Thanks. Oh, oh, can we not dim them? Um, yeah, so they're caused by external non-biological factors. So this is another really uh, important thing for all the uh, extinctions we know about so far, none of them have been caused by any life forms or any living forms. So uh, that is something worth bearing in mind for discussion afterwards as to our current extinction. Is that, is that now too dark? It's, um, can we just have the down lights on? The, uh, the other thing about mass extinctions is we, we, we can't predict when they're going to happen. They're totally unpredictable. Uh, they've tried uh, to, to, see, see, to see cyclicity or sequences in them, and there is nothing predictable about them at all. There's a, there's a row of downlights all the way around the side. That would be ideal if we could just keep those on and the other lights off. They've gone extinct. <laughs> Uh, and, and the one thing about mass extinctions is that they, uh, as I said, not, not caused by life itself. So they, are, uh, they effectively reset the evolutionary clock. In other words, uh, evolution was carrying on, carrying on quite happily. But mass extinctions uh, extinguish everything without regard for their success. It, it doesn't matter whether you're the most successful, or most adaptable, most, um, uh, most um, uh, abundant species on the earth. You get clupped just as badly as those rare and, and cryptic animals and plants. Uh, they all go with equal uh, veracity at, a, at an extinction, mass extinction event. The end Permian one, the one we're going to concentrate on, the, the, the biggest of all the mass extinctions we know, is 96%, so it's way over our 40% threshold. In fact, the uh, end, per, end Cretaceous one was 65%, the other biggest one we know. So this is another 30% bigger than any mass extinction previously, previously known. And uh, we do know that it is uh, less than 500,000 years, and our current thinking is perhaps as little as 60,000 years in terms of its total time it took from beginning to end of the extinction event, 60,000 years. Within there, we do have these 10,000-year pulses or stages or events of, of, of extinction. We're now getting very, uh, very good at uh, uh, studying uh, what's happening within that extinction zone itself, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. The uh, volcanic ashes, which is what we are using for our um, absolute dating of when this event took place, uh, the one uh, at which we are now most, um, most um, confident is 252 million years plus minus 50,000 years. And that was a date that has, uh, was, was uh, t taken from the marine record, not the terrestrial record, but as I'll show you uh, later, we have terrestrial records of that, uh, of that event, and we have been able to get absolute dates which are in this margin of error here. So the, um, the end Permian one, just this, the, the blue, the purple line is, is sort of the degree of uh, extinction intensity, if you like. Clearly, the end Permian one is much larger than any of those others. So it's worth looking at that one in particular, you know, simply because it's the largest expression of mass extinction, um, and finding out or, or, or hypothesizing what caused it, and then going out to find uh, evidence of that hypothesis. 
the current most um, accepted uh, hypothesis with the most evidence to support it is massive volcanic eruptions. The, uh, these uh, occurred in the northern part of Pangaea and uh, the escaping gases, uh, it, well, dust immediately around the, uh, um, the volcanic um, uh, emission site known as the, the it's, it's the, um, the, the flood basalts out up in uh, the Siberian traps area, the northern, northern uh, Russia, the area which is northern Russia now, at that time was the large uh, um, basaltic flood. That's just flood basalts coming out of the uh, crust, spreading out on the surface of the, uh, of the continent and releasing a lot of CO2 and methane at the same time. Now, the effect that that CO2 and methane had on the atmosphere is what we are getting more and more evidence as being the real cause of the mass extinction. It's the, it's the effect that that, that release of, of um, greenhouse gases that uh, had on the global climates of, of the planet is what we are now uh, gathering more and more evidence as to being the real driver of the mass extinction. So CO2 and methane, but CO2 especially, was the killer at the end Permian mass extinction. Uh, the effect of uh, atmospheric warming on, uh, on the oceans had uh, two, two basic effects. One was to warm the, uh, the surface of the sea such that the, the, um, the difference between the surface waters and the bottom waters uh, was was uh, increased. We got this uh, warming, in fact, of of uh, of the, the bottom waters at, at the time when there was oceanic overturn, where the surface waters rolled over and became uh, uh, subducted into the bottom of the ocean, and that released methane from the bottom of the ocean all at once because the pressure uh, holding the methane down in these almost frozen state in the methane clathrates in the seabed were uh, no longer able to hold the methane down and all bubbled up all at once. So this was a runaway methane effect, but also brought on by the global warming and uh, stagnation followed in the ocean depths, uh, anoxia, the, the de depletion of oxygen in the ocean depths and of course the effect that had on all the marine organisms. A meteorite impacts have been reported from uh, the PT boundary in Antarctica, but this has since been refuted. We cannot re du duplicate the results, and uh, so we do not have a meteorite uh, impact record for the PT boundary. How about that? So this, um, this uh, traps, the Siberian traps, if you go to the Siberian traps, this is what it looks like in the northern part of, of, uh, of Russia, in, uh, and, uh, th and uh, that sort of orange area is the uh, orange and the white area. The orange area is the, the area of, of uh, surface um, emission of the traps and the white area is a subsurface uh, intrusion. So there's a massive area of, of, uh, of volcanic rocks, much larger than any of these other orange patches, which are large igneous provinces, the continental provin large igneous provinces. And we have been able to tie many of these other large igneous provinces with other extinction events. So this one is not uh, unusual in being tied to an extinction event. And this is the... Uh, uh, the Siberian traps and the Emishan traps. These these one uh, Emishan, these ones here, uh, in uh, are both being dated with absolute dating to 252 million years. So they were both going on. This volcanism was going on at the time that the mass extinction was occurring. Therefore, we have to take it into account. If it's not the primary driver of the extinction, it has to be taken into account in whatever else we uh, find that was going on at that time. So we start to make a, an estimate of how much CO2 would have been exu exhumed or ex ex exhaled from um, five million cubic kilometers of, of lava. Uh, and we've got a sort of 65,000 billion tons of, of CO2. 
The, the question is, that's clearly enough uh, to create uh, a certain amount of global warming, but is it, is it enough and was it fast enough? That's the question. Can we, uh, can we uh, extend the period at which the, uh, the venting was going on uh, to create a, a larger time, a longer time in which the CO2 buildup was carrying on? And yes, we, we think we can. Uh, one of the um, more recent pieces of work is that this is when the two-thirds of the lava volume, the surface extrusion of, of uh, lava itself, comes onto the surface. But we do know that before the lava actually extrudes, there's lots of uh, degassing from the, uh, from the crust as it domes up and forms like a Yellowstone National Park type of phenomena where the, where the crust is actually doming up pre-eruption. So there's a lot of uh, eruption uh, of gases, emissions of gases before the actual eruption, but subsequent to the eruption, there is intrusion of sills and dikes. Now, when these happen, uh, especially when these happen along uh, into uh, uh, carbonaceous rocks or limestones, for instance, anything with carbon, di uh, carbon in it, it immediately uh, increases the carbon dioxide content of the gas that is emitted from the uh, degassing of the intrusion of sills. So we have a pre-eruption, an eruption, and a sill, uh, post-eruption post sill intrusion, which is really the whole entire phase of, of, um, of volcanic activity. And here, around the, the time of 252 million years, we have this uh, uh, the end of, the, the, end of the, the surface volcanism and the beginning of the intrusive sills, which is continuously contributing to the, um, the uh, atmospheric pollution at that time. The, um, uh, and the, uh, the atmosphere, we, we do use stable carbon isotopes to... Um, to record as a proxy um, f uh, stable carbon isotopes from the rocks and from the bones and teeth of the animals as a proxy for what was going on in the atmosphere at that time. And uh, we're able to use this stable carbon isotope gr uh, graph, if you like, uh, or this, this curve as a way of correlating between different sections. Because if it's a global uh, extinction event, the global curve of the car stable carbon isotope should be the same wherever you are on the surface of the planet. So there's the mechanism as a sort of pictogram, and you don't have to go through the whole thing, but basically it's the eruptions which cause the um, uh, gas emissions, the CO2 especially, which causes global warming, which warms the ocean, which acidifies the ocean, causes a marine mass extinction and at the same time uh, causes the lowering of groundwater, uh, well, uh, the lack of rainfall, basically, um, and uh, the rainfall belts on land move dramatically, uh, causing uh, the plants to die off, the animals to die off that are dependent on the plants, and a terrestrial mass extinction. Synchronous, simultaneous, and and at the same time. We, of course, need to prove that they happened at the same time, and we'll be doing that just now. Um, these are the study sites that I've been working on in, uh, in, in this pursuit of the evidence to, um, to find out how the mass extinction took place and what caused it. And uh, these are the sorts of places that I work, and still working, constantly going back and forth to various new sites as they're coming. My newer sites are, uh, for this year, I'm going into Mozambique, further up the rift valleys here, but again, going into looking for animals and plants and looking at the rocks to see, to try and prove this uh, null hypothesis that the degassing caused a global temperature rise between six to 10 degrees centigrade in uh, less than 100,000 years and more like 60,000 years far too fast for most organisms to adapt, thus uh, a mass extinction. So these are the two areas I want to take you to now because uh, we're going to look at the latitudinal effect. Did uh, what was happening here at, at uh, 45 degrees as well as what was happening at 75 degrees in the paleo-Pangean setting. Um, 
in terms of a, a climate model, this, this is simply a model, this is a very little um, good hard evidence to support this uh, 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 computer, computer generated model. We put it's a general circulation systems where we put in the data, but because it's in a Pangean setting and none of the models can really model what it's like to have um, all the continents on one side of the globe, they cannot really be um, uh, reliable. But we then go to uh, these places to look for evidence of what it was like at that time. So here in the Karoo Basin, in this part of Africa, this African bit of, Pan of Gondwana, uh, we have a cool temperate uh, climate, and down here we have a cold temperate climate. Notice at this time the, uh, there's no ice cap at the, at the poles. It's, they're both cold temperate, not um, polar. So, uh, that because of this is a period of uh, global global warming, if you like, the, uh, the models do not give us an ice cap. Uh, the topography needs to be considered before we get down into detail. This is Pangaea. The uh, lowland areas, the light, uh, light green areas, are all the areas in which we can accumulate rocks and, uh, of course, fossils in those rocks. So we only really know about what was going on on this part of Pangaea from these lowland areas. But what we do know is that these lowland areas were connected. Uh, and uh, the, we know that geologically as well as uh, biologically. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a row of, uh, a row, <laughs> this is a range of mountains known as the Gondwanite Mountains, caused by the collision of the Paleo Pacific Plate into the, uh, uh, into the, um, Af well, the Gondwanan Plate uh, as such. Um, that, um, that subduction creates the compression which causes these mountains rising along here. So the, the rivers flowing off these mountains into the lowland area along the uh, foreland basin of this uh, mountain range is where we get all our evidence. And you can see there was no major barriers between uh, uh, this area of the Karoo and this area of, uh, of which is now in Antarctica. So uh, we, uh, we would expect similarities and the differences uh, are worth noting. And the differences then, of course, would be due to the latitude, the paleo latitude. In the Karoo Basin first, this is the two, two very good study areas. We do have some more now, but these are the very nice uh, places where we look for, um, for the, uh, the geological evidence of, of what happened at this time. For, uh, for a long time, the, um, the Permo-Triassic boundary has been mapped in the Karoo Basin as, the, uh, as the, the boundary between the Katberg and uh, the Balfour Formation. So it was always put there, at that point there. That's where the ge ge old geological textbooks will put the, uh, the boundary. But from uh, basically my work, I've been able to drop that boundary now down to here. This is where the extinction event actually took place. Uh, the, uh, this is the 252 million year mark now. So we now have very good uh, overlapping uh, sections, uh, rock sections, that confirm now what was happening uh, in the Karoo Basin during this transition from, from these uh, Permian type rocks to these Triassic type rocks through the Permo-Triassic extinction. And there's a nice uh, typical example of the uh, outcrop. Uh, this one is uh, near New Bethesda. Uh, that's that um, Katzberg formation, which I was pointed out earlier. That's the sandy group that was previously the boundaries marked at the base of that, quite, quite um, rightly so. It is Permian, uh, it is a Triassic uh, nice mappable base, but we now know that the actual uh, 252 event uh, was down at this level here. This is the uh, top of the PT boundary bed, right there. So, so we'd be able to move that boundary down that slope uh, based on not just the, the extinction event using the fossils, these are in situ fossils, but uh, using the rocks as well. The rocks are telling us that that's where the major change took place. And the major change is really from um, rocks that are, of, are deposited by high sinuosity Mississippi-type meandering rivers, 
uh, into rocks which were deposited by low sinuosity braided uh, streams like the, the Brahmaputra, or I don't suppose you know many of those, but, but like a, a, a much less, a much lower sinuosity, much more sandy, wide channels. These are old man river sinuous, uh, uh, wet, wet floodplain channels, and these are um, much more rapid, ephemeral, fast-flowing, seasonal, and uh, wide and shallow sandy rivers. The bank, overbank material uh, is blue and gray here, uh, high in um, unoxidized iron, iron sulfates, which gives it a blue-gray appearance. Uh, there are soils in it, so there were plants growing and there were animals living quite successfully on those floodplains. And that at a point here, the, the floodplains turn red. The, the mud rocks turn into a red color, this sort of reddish color, and then um, we get, um, we get the, uh, uh, the influx of a whole new type of animals in these Triassic. So the extinction occurred at this point between the blue and the red mud rocks. That's, that was the first sort of observation. There's the red mud rocks in the, in the field. These are the blue mud rocks in the field with a big uh, dicynodon skull being excavated. And there are the red mud rocks. So that's, this comes from this level here. And this is this level here. This is the actual boundary here. Those are the rocks there. So we get that um, distinctive ch change in mud rock color, which needs to be explained. And the current best explanation is that it represents a period of drying, absolute aridity, in fact, where the floodplain water table dropped considerably below the, the general level uh, that they were before, where, the, the, where there were ponds and, and wet areas on the floodplain. This it, it suggests much drier, much more seasonal, and, uh, and far less rainfall at this time. So this is a nice uh, one of many of our outcrops of the Permo-Triassic boundary. This is the Caledon River down here. This is near Batuli. Uh, and uh, from the Caledon River, you're in the Permian, you walk up uh, the section to about this point here. That point there is where the um, uh, rocks turn from the gray, bluish gray color to the red color, and that's where the, uh, the boundary section, uh, the boundary has been placed in this, on this section. Uh, so it, we're going from rivers which were depositing the rocks at the, uh, looking like this through to rivers looking like this. So that is um, uh, the, the, the question then is what drove that transition? What caused those rivers to suddenly change in behavior? And uh, the, um, the current, uh, uh, let's say the current, my, my theory <laughs> is, is that uh, the loss of this vegetation, this, this um, strong, uh, um, heavily wooded banks of these rivers where the animals uh, were living, um, is uh, we lose that completely and uh, the bank strength is lost and the rivers become much straighter because there's nothing to hold the rivers into the high sinuosity systems and uh, the, uh, the floodplains become arid and dry and the only life is uh, then confined to the actual channels themselves uh, and these channels then become braided into a sheet of, of, uh, of, of interlocking sands and uh, that's well into the Katzberg or into the Triassic. We do then see this transition occurring in the uh, fossils, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So we have well, uh, a well-established um, field evidence for when, where the, uh, the boundary is. So there's the Permo-Triassic boundary. This is a new, new section where we're testing it. These are the red rocks of the Triassic. These are the blue rocks, although not that easily exposed here, not that well exposed, but there, there they are. But that's where we put, uh, but at this locality, this little sandstone here that is right at the boundary there, we've uh, been able to get zircons out of that sandstone, which have been dated to 251.7 plus minus 300,000 years. So we're now into the same uh, era area as the 252, point, uh, 252 million years, um, plus minus um, half a million years. So we are 
we are in that same zone. We, so we, we're very confident now that our permatrassic boundary is the same as the one in China. And our permatrassic boundary is clearly in a terrestrial setting. These are terrestrial rocks. These are river rocks. And the one in China is a marine rock. So we can now say with this evidence that the extinction on land was synchronous with the extinction in the ocean. They happened at the same time over the same 60 thousand years in geological time such that whatever we've come up with the final cause of this has to accommodate that it caused equal uh, equal extinction in, in on land and sea at the same time this is what the boundary looks like in our new little section these these uh, uh, devegetated de let's say uh, flood plains causing uh, just um, uh, these laminated red mud rocks and it was in this sandstone that we've got the, um, the zircons um, for, for dating. So, this is uh, um, not on, it's, it, Lutzberg Pass is one of the sections, and it looks exactly the same in Lutzberg Pass. If you go there, you'll see exactly the same beds. One of the, um, uh, one of the things I'll point out is that wherever we go, we see the same sequence of, of fasces uh, from, uh, from section to section. This is in the Batuli area, so it's considerably further north from Lutzburg Pass, but same, same uh, fasces. The, um, so the interpretation then is, if, is um, down in the, uh, in the um, sort of Permian section, we get uh, sections like this of this in this endogenetic alluvial plain would be a good modern analog for the Permian section. And if you go into the Triassic section, uh, rapidly it changes to a scene like this. And the air basin in, uh, in Australia, central Australia, would be, um, would be a very good um, modern analog for what the conditions were like in the earliest Triassic. Uh, so those two pictures, I just want you to, to get those two pictures in your mind because we will be constantly fitting everything into this sort of scenario. Whichever observation we make, we sort of see where would it fit in this type of thing. The, incidentally, the air basin is an inland basin. In other words, it's surrounded completely by, uh, by mountains and stable plateau such that the rivers flowing in there don't flow out. They just flow to ground or to lakes or drying up pans, similarly to that which we can see in this environment here. So we have a very um, good modern analog to go and look for what happens to the animals and plants in this sort of scenario. Uh, can we see the same things happening here? And can we see in, in the rocks what we can observe over here? So that's the, the way we use modern analogs to help understand the ancient record. The mass extinction, as I said, we have, re we have recorded it in these sections, and in each section we record the, uh, the same sequence of extinction, if you like, of animals. These are all uh, types of uh, tetrapod, uh, four-legged uh, vertebrate animals, and uh, there are small herbivores, large herbivores, and carnivores. We are going to go into a lot more detail in this uh, tomorrow, but I just needed you to know that we have been able to define this uh, extinction event at the top of what we call phase two. So there's this big, this is the big extinction within a three-phased extinction. So the top of the big extinction is where we're drawing that line. Everyone likes to draw a line. We don't, of course, need to. We can just say the extinction happened between minus 45 here and plus 30 there. That's 70 meters of strata in which the extinction took place. That's OK. But people like to draw a line because we have this word, the Permian, and we have the word, the Triassic. So we need to put a, de a defined uh, line there. So, and that's where the line is at the moment. We'll go in more into the extinction, uh, these animals, tomorrow. But be that as it may, we've now been able to draw that line in the rock there. And at the same time, draw uh, an isotope, stable carbon isotope curve that um, go goes through that interval. And you'll see that the maximum negative excursion, the maximum way, uh, the maximum distance it is in this direction, uh, is at the point uh, of that line. So we do have this negative excursion in the stable carbon isotopes measured from 
soil nodules, these ancient soil carbonates, as well as from the uh, enamel, from uh, the teeth of the herbivores. There's a tusk of a herbivore. So we measure it from there. So we're m measuring basically the atmospheric carbonate, the, the atmospheric um, uh, CO2 measured indirectly through the soils and then even more indirectly through the vegetation that the animal was eating and putting down into its teeth. Nevertheless, still used as a good proxy for the atmosphere. We, we use it today, we use it for hominids, why not use it for mammalian-like reptiles? So it is all in a perfect balance. You are what you eat. Uh, so in your enamel, your tooth enamel reflects exactly what you had for breakfast. So. The, uh, another way of uh, synchronizing these sections is to use paleomagnetometry. Uh, you need to be a geophysicist to do this. I'm not, but I allow all the geophysicists to come to my sections to test the hypotheses. This is what the geophysicists do to your outcrop. It's, uh, it's uh, geovandalism, certainly not what uh, a good paleontologist. We, we cover our tracks all the time. Obviously, physicists don't have to, you know. Sheldon would love that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the uh, ne a negative excursion that we found in the Karoo Basin, we can line it up with the negative excursion found at Meishan, uh, at, and that a negative excursion has been given 252 million years. Our negative excursion, 251.7 million years and we draw on it at that um, maximum whammy of our uh, uh, extinction of the, uh, of the, the vertebrates, uh, and the uh, paleomag puts it there. So we've been able to then line up all the evidence, the, the lithostratigraphy, the paleomag, the isotope stratigraphy, the actual um, biostratigraphy, uh, and correlate it with, with Meishan. So, and of course, it all correlates at the same time with the Siberian traps. So it's, it's, it's all coming together. Now we've got to, we've got to, we've got to nail it. You know, it, it's, that's still superficial evidence. It's still big picture stuff. We need to get down to some details. These are the zircons from, from that actual sample. These are the actual uh, datable uh, minerals. They're basically bits of volcanic glass, if you like. And the youngest detrital zircon is the youngest age that we've got for this. So we, ex we assume then that this little zircon came from volcanism which was happening at the time in which the rock was being put down. So that uh, would date the time at which the rock was being um, deposited as 251.7. So what does, this, what does this all mean in terms of uh, what was happening in the Karoo Basin? There's Butuli and Lutzberg. We line up the sections, everything was, and we've now got a date. Let's uh, look at the, we looked at the transition. This is what it means. But, but there's this thing I put in here. The, the, let's say we've got this uh, physical uh, um, switch from uh, low to high and to, um, to uh, wet floodplains to dry floodplains to temperate to warm temperate, if you like. So we are uh, getting a, a very different view of the climatic changes at that time. And of course, drought. Now, we, we've, we've all got to, uh, we've got to be sure we know what we're talking about by drought. Drought is really a, 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 a biological phenomena, of course. At this time, we were talking about aridity. Uh, once, once we can prove aridity, then we can prove drought, if you like. So we'll look at the rocks to prove aridity. We'll look at the fossils to prove drought. What have we got for evidence of aridity in these early Triassic rocks? We've got um, uh, reddening, uh, desiccation cracks, these ferricretes and rhizocretions, they're very rough surface. That's the type of soils which are forming in these, these um, uh, semi-desert uh, floodplains. Uh, and gullying, this, this, this phenomenon of gullying is, uh, is, is extremely uh, obvious when you go out there and walk up these sections. The base of the, of the sandstone suddenly become gullied uh, and lots of eroded soils being uh, deposited in the channels. So there's the, the sand-filled mud cracks. I don't think anyone can, uh, can uh, 
contradict that they are mud cracks and they are, have been filled with sand, while, whether the sand is windblown or uh, water lane, uh, these do show ripple marks in them such that they are water lane uh, deposits filling the sand, but uh, filling the crack in the, mud, in the floodplain. So there's clearly a series, series of uh, flood desiccation, flood desiccation events going up through the succession. And this is in the, in the um, above, this is above the boundary in the earliest Triassic. And the, the streams suddenly become very erosive in their base. This is what happens when the flood, when the flash floods, when you become uh, not a nice perennial river flowing gently and having a little peak uh, in winter. These things are dry up uh, and then come down in force when the uh, uh, monsoonal type um, rainfalls or these big thunderclap uh, rainfall events happen and it scours out the base of the channel, scouring out the, the uh, soils in these uh, floodplain mud rocks and dumping them into the channel. There's some of the um, soil nodules which have been scoured and dumped into the channel. And when you look at those more closely, they have a very particular uh, morphology. This is what we call septarian shrinkage cracks. But these are very distinctive of, uh, of soil nodules which are, put, uh, uh, which are formed on parts of the floodplain which rarely get flooded by the river. In other words, they, they're on terraces or parts of the floodplain which have been abandoned. So the uh, floodplain is now, these new channels are now scavenging these abandoned terraces, which is a good indication of the lowering of water table in the entire area due to drought due to aridity. There's a bone fragment uh, of a piece of Lystrosaurus in, the, in there. The bone fragments, some of them are, are, are surrounded with calcareous nodule material like this, such that they have already been buried and re-eroded. So this is good indication that already buried bones are being re-eroded, taken out of the floodplain and redeposited in the channel. Uh, flute casts, another good indication of rapid uh, sedimentation, uh, shallow, uh, shallow turbulent flow followed by rapid sedimentation of fine sand. Uh, upward fining, uh, upward uh, uh, climbing ripples, these are ripple faucets and they're climbing up these, this, uh, one ripple is climbing on the back of another. That's very good indication there was lots of sediment in the water uh, as when the flood came in and its rapid deposition. It can't get rid of its load fast enough, so it has to dump, uh, uh, the, the ripples climb up on top of each other. Very good indication of this type of sedimentation. And of course, uh, mud cracks, again, within the channel deposits themselves, showing that they did dry up. They were ephemeral uh, type of, uh, of streams. And this uh, very distinctive um, uh, laminated flat plate, uh, uh, um, uh, horizontal lamination. But each one of these lamination surfaces has got clay, little clay minerals which have been imbricated on the surface. So they've, they've had flow over them, very shallow flow, which has allowed the clay minerals to almost armor the surface, forming a very distinctive uh, structure, which is uh, a desert stream structure. Raindrop impressions, uh, very interesting, and uh, these conglomeratic um, clay, clay class conglomerates at the base of, uh, in, in, uh, not just at the base of the channels, but throughout the channel, wherever there has been a sedimentation event, it's ripped up bits of the floodplain and dumped it into the channel. Look at the color of these red mud rocks on either side of it. The, the soils themselves, they also give a good story. You, uh, we have pedologists, paleopedologists, um, studying these and doing the geochemistry of these, but I prefer to just to stick to the structure. And we're in the, in the, this is in the Permian, the, the soils are mottled, they have these um, uh, glaying, it's called, it's an indication of high water tables. Uh, and the only oxygen getting down into these parts of the f uh, soil profile were down root channels. So the root channel allows oxygen into it and forms a mottled uh, surface and usually a maroon color around a gray rock such that uh, we can 
say that this was a, a hydromorphic clay uh, in, in soil terms. Uh, whereas down in the, in the Triassic, the, the big, big desiccation cracks come down into the soils. Uh, we have um, evidence of uh, underground burrowing, uh, which we'll be going into a lot tomorrow, because this was one of the immediate um, ways in which the uh, tetrapods and were able to combat the uh, sudden change in, in climate. Uh, and lots of ferricrete, lots of iron now in the system that is um, very evident in the red colors. So let's go now to uh, the southern part. So let's go down here and see how, um, how all this affected um, the, the, um, uh, the Antarctic side of, uh, of the globe, that what, is, what is now in, Antarct in Antarctica. But remember, it was just a bit further along the Gondwanites. I was there for, I've been there three times, but this was the, in 2010. I was there just before the big earthquake and just after the, the one that brought down the cathedral. The cathedral uh, is still not re reconstructed. That was when I first went. And this is what it looks like now, because I, uh, I was there earlier. I was there this time last year. In fact, right now, I was in Antarctica uh, last year, right at this, this in, in uh, January. So um, this is the, I went with the Americans, always with Americans, and uh, this is the, the, the place where we get kitted up with Big Red. Big Red is your survival uh, jacket, and without that, you would freeze when you're out there. But that, that apparently, you can actually sleep in, exposed in that and, and stay alive with, with the right, um, if you dig a snow shelter. Getting out to, um, to uh, McMurdo Base in a, a transporter plane, it was brilliant, but uh, the, this is my first view of Erebus, Mount Erebus, which is still an active volcano. Uh, the McMurdo base is within, uh, within, the, um, within eyesight of Mount Erebus. Landing on the ice, uh, that, um, that's the only way we can get an airstrip to, to, to get these large um, transporter planes um, onto the so it's landed on the sea ice. So that means we've got to come in when the sea ice is hard enough or, and, and before it starts to crumple. So everything is always done uh, at a... Uh, there's a lot of sitting and waiting for the, for the uh, snow to clear and a lot of um, hanging around and then suddenly running for the airport. Because it's, it it's constant daylight there, so you can fly and do everything any time. And this is where we're living in the most ugliest place on earth. It's, uh, it's a typical um, uh, US army base. It's, it's run by the army, and, uh, but it's funded by the National Science Foundation. The, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a typical um, place to get trained. We have to always go through training here. I was very pleased that they uh, acknowledged my presence because most of it, uh, most of them, of course, are U.S. citizens here. The training uh, is to, to be able to put up these tents on, in the ice and also tie knots. We had to know how to tie the, the knots properly uh, because you may think it's trivial, but when you're out there in a blizzard and you're got, having gloves on and you're, somebody is not knotted into a slip knot, then you can actually uh, have real problems getting into your tent or getting into your food um, cache or something like that. So we had to be able to tie knots which you would be able to undo with gloves on. Um, and the gamo bag, which is what we have to do where anybody who suffers from altitude sickness, we put them in there and, and then you just pump this thing and keep on pumping until they look like they're reviving. <laughs> and we don't, don't actually know what you're supposed to do after that, but, <laughs> but that's all we were told we had to do. I suppose we had to evacuate them after, uh, after they, they'd come around. But it's in there that you can overcome the effects of hypoxia. And we had to all learn how to get out of a crevasse just using a prosic rope, not uh, nothing else. So just using this prosic uh, system, which we carry all the time, we could then get out of a, a crevasse if you fell in. It's, that's, we're, we're simulating this one, but that's basically... And if you couldn't do it yourself, if you actually couldn't climb out, then you weren't allowed to go out onto the, uh, onto the glaciers. So. 
And uh, we also had to learn how to live out on the glaciers if the helicopters didn't come and pick you up. So it means making a snow shelter, getting into your emergency cooking, and using uh, a shortwave radio if your sat phone didn't work. And of course, uh, getting out into the, onto the glacier. This is uh, Beardmore Glacier in 2003 and 10, and this is the latest one. This is where I was this time last year on, uh, on Shackleton Glacier. And on the glaciers, we live in uh, little pup tents like this. And, uh, and, but we don't live on the actual base for very long, because most of the time we go from there up in, onto the mountain tops. Uh, this is the mess at Christmas. We had to stay in uh, camp for Christmas this year. This was, this was Christmas last year. Uh, but uh, then, s as soon as we could, we packed up our, our tent and, and gear, um, rock saw and things, to get out onto the mountain tops where, uh, where, the, where the work was to be done. So that's the CTAM, that's the base. And we were doing work on the, all these, these mountain tops, basically. And the graphite peak, uh, which is the most successful one, and I'll keep showing you this because we would found a lot of fossils here as well, but I'm just going to show you the geology of, uh, of the PT boundary section. So, so here we have, uh, just from eyeballing from a distance, we have actually here we have the, the equivalent of that Katberg sandstone uh, further along the, uh, the foreland basin. That's what it looks like here. And below here is the Permian, above here is the Triassic. So the PT boundary is around at that point there. It was mapped at that point there, of course, by the previous mappers. So uh, our campsite then we put there. So we were able to get near to some dead ice. This is the closest bit of dead ice to our section, so we camped down here so we could get ice for water. That's our camp, and uh, just anchoring it, there was no way you could put pegs into this place, so it's, uh, it's, it's solid frozen, everything is solid, minus 30 or so, something like that, so it is uh, not, uh, not easy to, to keep your tent uh, anchored, uh, except by making cairns. Um, the uh, very, very sort of basic, uh, ba basic. I suppose this is a luxury for having, having sk Skippy and Gin. Well, what more? What more could you want? <laughs> what more could you want? But this is the mason, This is the, um, the Coleman stove, which uh, it may seem primitive, but it's absolutely foolproof in, the, in that all the gas stoves they don't work. They can't be relied upon to work. They get blocked and everything. You can always um, make a common stove work. Uh, even you can take it all apart. We know how to do that. But this works on benzene, and you pump it up and prime it. But once it's going, it goes fine. This is water, always water. And uh, everything else is frozen, which has to be defrosted, then, uh, then eaten. So it's all a matter of, of uh, defrosting and eating. That's, uh, but everything's frozen, so there's no chance of anything going off. You know? Even the Jose Cuvero doesn't go off. You know? uh, every morning, we had to, the one contact with base, we had to make a, a, a phone call in to say we were OK. And if we didn't, at 8 o'clock each morning, we'd, if we didn't do that, they would come and, um, come and collect us. Uh, this is the communications tent where we communicate with nature, and uh, this is this is basically uh, how uh, how it happened. I, I, I just put this in to, to because people always ask how you did it. Uh, you do it separately, by the way. Uh, the solids and liquids are separated. Uh, solids go in here, liquids go into uh, the pea bottle, and uh, there's of course no water for washing or anything. We just use. Whatever there was no water for washing at all for five weeks, so uh, we didn't wash as such. We um, we had a baby grow on thing, so a Polypro baby suit that covers your whole body, and that stays on for as long as um, yeah for five weeks. It's it's that's, it was no way there, there was any water for washing. Uh, it's only for drinking. So that's where we had to walk up to each day, up to this section here, to look at what uh, I'd measured this section. So uh, I'd identified this point here as being the Permatrassic boundary. And this is what I want to show you, really, um, at the, in the geological part of this. We'll be revisiting this site tomorrow as the, in, from a paleontological point of view. But uh, the, the, the sudden change from this type of 
of um, this type of sandstone to this conglomeratic uh, and much more uh, is this gullet space sensor. So I, I recognize those gullet bases immediately with this conglomerate. I recognize it's a reddening in the mud rocks. Uh, uh, 